For our scripture reading this morning, we'll be looking at two different sections of scripture, one from 1 Chronicles chapter 15, the other from 2 Samuel chapter 6. We will put the text of these passages on the screen for you, so if you're watching along, uh, you'll be able to uh, read right, right on the screen. Uh, if you'd like to join with me, though, you can turn your scriptures to 1 Chronicles chapter 15, and we'll begin there in 1 Chronicles 15, and then we'll switch over to 2 Samuel chapter 6. First Chronicles chapter 15, we'll read verses 1 to 3 and 12 to 15. David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, for the Lord had chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. And David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place which he had prepared for it. Dropping down to verse 12. And said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. Because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us, because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. And the Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders with the poles, as Moses had commanded, according to the word of the Lord. Now we'll transition over to 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. And we'll read verses 14 through the end of the chapter. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people, the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. Then all the people departed, each to his own house. And David returned to bless his household. But Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today, uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants, female servants, as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. And David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself yet more contemptible than this, and I will be abased in your eyes. But by the female servants of whom you've spoken, by them I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Before our morning message, let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask for his blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you that even though you are ultimately holy and we are not, you still desire to make us holy, that we might have fellowship with you. We do thank you for sanctifying us through the work of Jesus Christ. And we're thankful that we can then have fellowship with you and fellowship with one another. Because of all that you have done for us, Lord, may we love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And as David desired and delighted in you and desired to demonstrate that to you, may we also look for opportunities to display our love to you. May it be fueled by the, the faithfulness that you have shown to us and the grace that you bestow to us every day. We thank you for your mercies which are renewed every morning. And we ask that you would give us that kind of grace to share with others 
that we might have mercy on others because you have had great grace and mercy upon us. May our love for you spill out into our love for one another. And may we demonstrate that to this world and in this generation, that they might see our love for you, our love for others, and glorify you in heaven. And we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Grace and peace to you all. We welcome you to our online service. I guess that sounds better than our virtual service. And we hope that you are serving the Lord, trusting the Lord, growing in the Lord, studying his word, and finding new, new ways to glorify him with your life. We come to this second half of 2 Samuel chapter 6, in which I've entitled, How to Dance Like David. Think for a moment that what we saw before is that God's justice against Uzzah triggered anger in David, David's anger. Uh, he had been king for seven years, and yet he found it uh, a foolish action to follow the example of the Philistines, how they carried the ark, rather than how the law required the ark be transported. And so he breaks the Mosaic law, and a well-intended man by the name of Uzzah, uh, it, well, it cost his life. It's easy for us to think critically of God. It's easy for people to judge God, especially when God acts in severe punishment and he judges sin and disobedience. But behind God's justice is God's unassailable holiness. I guess I could say David had a right to be upset with himself. And a lot of times when we feel short-tempered with God or impatient with God or critical of God and the way what God is doing in the world around us even now or in our lives, we should really look to our own heart during the, the time that the ark was in the home of Obed-Edom, David learned that you can't have the blessing of God or the presence of God without seriously considering and honoring the holiness of God. It, it is God pleased by our life, our worship, uh, when it treats God's word carelessly, and sees God casually. Oftentimes around us in our society, there are churches that seem to be put an emphasis on celebrating God to the expense and in the absence of the command to fear God. There's little reverence of God. And you would agree with me that there is plenty of of evidence in God's word, Old Testament and New, that we should fear the Lord our God. I would qualify that saying that the redeemed do not to fear the wrath of God, but we do acknowledge by our life the power and the holiness of God. And it causes us to bow the knee and it causes us to, to be joyful and yet reverent. The answer is not to shrink back from God in some type of a disabling fear, but rather to go forward serving the Lord with obedience and joy, all marked by reverence. As we saw, David's second attempt at moving the ark was marked by obedience and sacrifice, and as we see in this passage, and joy. At my mother-in-law's funeral just not too long ago, a young lady who lives up that way, who used to be in our church, came up to me and she said, I remember something you used to say and that you told me in counseling one time that the right thing in the wrong way or at the wrong time is wrong. And David learned that God 
is to be loved and obeyed. I'd like you to listen or follow with me as I read some of these verses from 1 Chronicles chapter 15. 1 Chronicles 15, and I will read verses 1 through 3. David built houses for himself in the city of David. He prepared a, a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said that no one, that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, for the Lord had chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. And David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place, which he had prepared for it. Skip down to verse 12. David speaking to the, to the priests, he said to them, You are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. Listen now, verse 13. Because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel. The Levites carried the ark of God on their shoulders. No more new carts with poles as Moses had commanded, as Moses had commanded according to the word of God. Worship of God should never become mundane, thoughtless, automatic. It should be biblical. It should be deliberate. It should be prepared. It should be thought through. It should never be careless. We should never approach worship in a worship light way. You know what I mean by that? Uh, half the reverence, half the love and joy, half the obedience. Our worship should be according to God's word and for God. Let's look first of all at why David danced. David's heart was set on bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. And why is that? Because he was a traditionalist? Because he was just religious? Well, we learn from the Psalms how David loved to love God. And hopefully that is important to us today. Hopefully we are learning, whether it is in corporate worship here at the ministry center or meeting together at the same time to study God's word or meeting uh, in a small group uh, to read and study God's word, or alone. We should love to love God. We often focus on David dancing. But I would have you see from this passage that David's dancing was one of many facets of his celebration, of his sacrifice, of his worship before the Lord. And no, I am not going to show you uh, what I think David looked like dancing. But uh, we are going to figure out what that means. So should we dance today like David? And the answer is no. And the answer is yes. We shouldn't focus on how can we bring in some ancient liturgical dance into the church? Or how can we bring modern dance into the church and call it scriptural? Rather, we should look at how we serve God, how we worship God as part of our dance or celebration before God. First of all, David truly delighted in the Lord. Psalm 37 verse 3 says to trust in the Lord. And the next verse reminds us that we should delight ourselves in the Lord. To delight in the Lord is is a lot more than some euphoric feeling. It is a learned response. David learned that the desire of his soul recognized God as his creator and savior. David wanted to bring worship to God 
He, wanted to, he needed the ark. The ark served as a, a visible marker or reminder for the literal presence of God. We said before, God is spirit. He is everywhere at all times, and yet he promised to meet with them The point for us is that all our service, all our worship and praise should be done in the presence of God and for the person of God, not for each other. We were created to love God and enjoy him forever. And that falls way short of the reason a lot of people go to services on Sunday. They go because they feel they need to, or what might others think, or how can I barter with God through this, or how will it give me credit to my account because I'll need that at a later time. Our passion should be to worship Christ with other believers. Our pursuit, our pleasure, our passion should be to tell of his greatness by our life and with our lips. Well, once the ark of God was placed in a tent, First Chronicles 16 tells us that David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. Again, our reverence should be, our worship should be reverent. It should be jubilant all at the same time. I think it's important for us to acknowledge that David here is not some type of a passive observer, but he is an active worshiper. And in all our worship before God, we should be growing in acknowledgement of this and in the activity of this, that I am here to engage in worshiping the Almighty God. I'm not here to have arms folded. I don't keep my mouth shut during singing. I I don't allow my mind to wander. I am engaged. I am in the presence of God. He delighted in his Lord. Secondly, he refused to serve God half-heartedly. He refused to serve God half-heartedly. Probably a good number of us have memorized at some point in our life some verses from Ecclesiastes chapter 9 that say, whatever your hand finds to do it, do it with all your might. And we remember a verse in 1 Corinthians 10.31 that whether therefore you eat or drink, uh, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so when David worshipped, he worshipped God thoroughly. And when David danced, whatever that looked like, he did it, our, our text says in chapter 6 and verse 14, before the Lord with all his might. David had much to rejoice over. The Lord had made him king and brought him to this place. The Lord had united the kingdom. The Lord had allowed for the ark to be brought back. And David says, I'm, I'm not, never going to do this with less than my best. And when we sing and when we speak and when we play an instrument and when we read scripture and when we teach and when we preach, all our corporate worship should be planned and precious, but it should never be merely a matter of performance for the ears and eyes of others. David worshiped Jesus Christ, who is our priest king. He humbled himself. David could dance and David could offer worship, but the Lord Jesus Christ himself suffered and died in our place and became our sacrifice. That's why David danced, to delight in the Lord and to refuse to do anything half-heartedly before the Lord. Let's look secondly at why this wife of his, McCall, despised him for it. David was despised by Shimei. He was despised and cursed and followed after by Saul. But was he prepared that there was going to be resistance by one of his wives? Sometimes there is a pressure to buckle under a pressure from maybe it's a disapproving coworker. 
or a disapproving relative, or in this case of his, a disapproving spouse. I think David learned early, and David learned often, that he had to value the, the approval of God rather than man. We must obey God rather than men. And the only way that we have any approval is through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not that our works gain the favor of God, but in the sense that, like Luther, David was basically telling his wife, here I stand, I can do no other. Notice that she did not share his delight in the Lord. In verses 14 and 15, David danced. All the house of, of Israel brought up the ark with shouting, with the, with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, verse 16, Michal, the daughter of David, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. Here we see them not knitted together as it should be in worship and in marriage, but there is a deep divide between them. David could not help but express his joy in the Lord. And McCall, his wife, could not help but by be disgusted by what she saw. Again, worship and service should not be a spectator sport. The priest, the Levites, the elders, the musicians, the king, they all, it says, all the house of Israel, verse 15, they were all engaged in this celebration. And when we gather together to praise God, it should be that our hearts are knitted together, not that some are delighting and some are disgusted. Why wasn't she also dancing by his side. Was he doing something wrong? No, I would say rather he was doing the most fitting, the most proper thing that this new king could possibly do. And she goes on to say and they, that, that she despised him in her heart, that she basically accuses him of being immodest skip down to verse 20 then McCall the daughter of David uh, daughter of Saul came out to meet David and said how the king of Israel honored himself today that's an accusation uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants female servants as one of the vulgar fellows shamelessly uncovers himself if David had been immodest he clearly would have been breaking God's law. Back in Exodus chapter 20, verse 26, it says, And you shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness should be not exposed on it. I assure you that whatever this looked like, David was not acting beneath his station. David was not acting in some vulgar manner, but David was acting rather in a priestly manner. What David did, this, this ephod that he puts on, was not something spontaneous. It was not inappropriate dress. It was part of his prepar preparation, that which he had thought about ahead of time. It was a thought through worship. David considered himself, and he's not corrected in this, David considered himself to have priestly credentials. He wears the linen ephod that would have been worn by priests, by the Levites. I don't think David sees himself in the Aaronic line, but more Melchizedekian, if we can make up a word. David uh, it says that he brought the sacrifices. Verse 16 or 18, when David had finished offering the burnt offerings, and again, the peace offerings, was this David laying hands and doing the sacrifice or authorizing the Levites to do it. I don't know that we would know fully. But I'll tell you this. I don't know that any of us 
can have in our mind's eye what his wife McCall looked like. But doesn't she remind you of somebody? Her response sounds very pharisaical. The Pharisees had contempt for Jesus just as McCall had contempt for David. She couldn't bring herself to appreciate David's joy because she did not share in what he loved. And in this sense, in this chapter, McCall is presented as truly a tragic figure. Point B, she did not respect him, David, as her Lord, not capital, but little L, lowercase l. So we're told in 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 29, that McCall looked out her window. She's looking out to see what all the commotion is. What's all this noise? What's all this excitement? And she's shocked and disgusted to find her husband, David the king, in the center of it all. It's possible that at some point in my life, I have embarrassed my wife. Maybe once. But McCall didn't mind her husband being in the station of king and commander of the army. But what she didn't enjoy was to see her husband acting in this low and common and priestly manner. The greatest pursuit of the believer is loving God. And the proof that we love ourselves more than God is when we're more concerned about the opinion of others. She didn't value what her husband did. She didn't support his actions on that day. It takes humility to in honor prefer one another. It takes grace to set aside our selfish views and rather to edify one another and serve Christ in doing so. McCall is David's wife, but she's showing that without a doubt, there's a resemblance. She is looking like and acting like her father Saul and resisting David in his activities. So in our text, verses 18 and 19, that while the, the nation joins David in offering these offerings to God and feasting together. It says that the whole nation was there. There was a great representation at least. But one is noticeably absent. McCall is not there. Or is she? She's back in her room practicing her speech to shame David she, she obviously was disappointed in the kind of king that her husband had become. And in all of this, I would say that there certainly was no submission to David, and rather, really, in, her, in not honoring her husband, she makes this very unfair, inaccurate accusation of him. Here was her husband acting just like a, a priest. And I think that if we use our imagination, we can almost view her disapproving look. I think that her low view of her, her husband was connected to her low estimation of Jehovah God. When she didn't submit herself to her husband, she was actually setting herself over his God. David's correction of her in verses 21 and 22 when he says, it was before the Lord. Remember, she said, you have done this for yourself. And he says, it was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me as prince over Israel, the people of the Lord. And I will celebrate before the Lord. I will make myself more contemptible than this. I will be abased in your eyes, but by 
the female servants of whom you have spoken by them, I shall be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. I think what we have here is David responding to the Lord's blessings. He intended to go on honoring God, even if it meant that he would be abased or if he would appear humiliated to people like her. We come to the third point, which is why this should make a difference to every believer. And we have four points to cover before we're done. The first is this, because we should love Christ more every day in view of the blessings bestowed on us through Calvary. All our singing, our offering, our praise, our service, all of that should be done in light of Calvary, what God has done for us. None of us are qualified as sons of Adam to approach a holy God. Jesus is our substitute. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus brings us before the Father. All of us would be foolish to try to help ourselves towards God or to cross the line like Uzzah did were it not for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who brings us to God and dresses us in his righteousness alone. Secondly, this makes a difference, this passage does, because we need to be determined that God's view of us is more important than the possible disapproval of others. Let me read to you one verse from Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. Paul says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And I would ask you to look into your own heart. Why do I serve? Why do I do this? My service is secondary. I'm looking to Jesus, the author. I'm delighting in him. I love my Lord, and that causes me to serve him. I'm in no way trying to gain the favor of Jesus Christ, and I in no way need the, the favor of man. Thirdly, because we should all actively, enthusiastically, and then I added there, reverently participate in corporate worship of the Almighty. And sometimes the Old Testament Jews were to participate in their festivals with shouts and loud singing. And David did this. Add to all this that sacrifices were made. Our worship today looks and sounds quite different than what we, we read described for us in 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're not Old Testament Israel. And the New Testament teaches us that our singing should, should be to God, but it should also teach and admonish one another, Colossians 3, verse 16. We're to sing with this in view, that we praise with our spirit, but with our mind also, 1, Chronicles, 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Psalm 2, verse 11 said that we should serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And furthermore, our worship should be done decently and in order. I pause to say thank you in months past and years past how you have ministered to me by your singing. And sometimes I may drop out for a verse or a chorus. Sometimes just before the message, I stop singing to listen and to be ministered by what you're singing, how you are singing. By the way, are you using your voice as an instrument of holy joy? Is your worship done this way? What David said when he said that he would celebrate verses 5 and verse 21, that's a perfectly good word. He uses a, a Hebrew word, that uh, has as, at its root a meaning that can be to laugh. David says, I come in not with hilarity, but with true joy. 
We don't need to compare our worship or base our worship. Well, we yell at ballparks, and so we need to yell here. But the standard should be there is joy in serving Jesus. And finally, because we should value identification with our Savior much more precious than any any worldly acceptance and acclaim. Should we dance like David? Well, no. And yes. And pastor, make up your mind. I think our mind should be made up not that we should try to figure out, well, what does this look like, this physical dancing, and how do I do that today, and how do we incorporate that in worship, but how does my life, in my, the devotion of my heart, and any service that comes out of that, how does it show that irrepressible joy in serving Jesus? Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, Receive our worship today, but first prepare our hearts for worship. We are prone to read the directions afterwards, but we desire to learn from David and to come on our knees before you. Thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Thank you for the perfect obedience that secures our salvation. Help us to come always reverently in adoration of the one who has purchased us by his blood and help us to rejoice in God our Savior today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.